All right. Hello. Welcome to the Other People Podcast. I'm Brad Listy in Los Angeles. It's good to be with you. Thank you for tuning in. I'm very excited about today's program. Louise Erdrich is my guest. She has a new novel out on Harper. It is called The Sentence. And if I have my math right, I believe this is her 18th novel. Something like that. Louise Erdrich is one of America's most celebrated authors. It's an honor to have her on the show. Her debut novel, Love Medicine, won the 1984 National Book Critics Circle Award. She then won the National Book Award for Fiction in 2012 for her novel, The Roundhouse. There was another National Book Critics Circle Award in 2016 for her novel entitled La Rose. And this very year, 2021, she was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction for her novel, The Night Watchman. Louise Erdrich has also received the Library of Congress Prize in American Fiction, the Penn Saul Bellow Award for Achievement in American Fiction, and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. So at this point, like what else is there to do? I mean, I know there's always more to do, but she has had an amazing career. Louise Erdrich is a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, Native Americans. And she lives in Minnesota with her daughters, where, in addition to writing books, she is the owner of Birchbark Books, a small independent bookstore, which, incidentally, figures into this latest novel, The Sentence. And you're going to hear Louise and I talk about that in just a moment. Today's episode is brought to you by Custom House Books, publisher of Burnt Coat, the new novel by Sarah Hall, her first novel in six years. Sarah Hall has twice been nominated for the Man Booker Prize, and she has now uh, written an incredibly timely novel, Burnt Coat, that is not only about the spread of a deadly virus, but is also about immigration and about women in the art world. That's Burnt Coat from Custom House Books, an imprint of HarperCollins. Available now. Get your copy wherever books are sold. The Other People Podcast is a listener-supported show. If you like this program and you would like to support it and help sustain it into the future, you can do that at patreon.com slash otherpplpod. For as little as $1 a month, you can support this show. Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash other PPL pod. The other people podcast also has its own YouTube channel. Search for it by name over at YouTube, other PPL. The entire archive is on YouTube. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's free. So my guest today, once again, is Louise Erdrich. Her new novel, The Sentence, is available from Harper. It was an absolute delight to talk with her, uh, to read her novel, and to just have the opportunity to pick her brain. What a rare gift. And I'm so pleased to get to share this conversation with you right now. Here she is, folks. This is Louise Erdrich, and her new novel, One More Time, is called The Sentence. But I cannot describe this ghost because I am afraid that it will stop being a beneficial ghost. So I can't, I can't talk about this ghost. That's all I, I probably shouldn't have said that, but I wanted to have some, you know, ghost cred for this book, right? Right, so yes. I, I, I probably just put it in to try and um sound ghosty it's 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 too easily scared off or whatever might happen and it's up in my office so i don't want to it's helping me and i respect that and i do not want to i myself do not want to upset this ghost at all thank you i have I, i what i will say though is that i have no ghost cred like okay. I have, I have no supernatural 
cred in my life. And I wish that I did. And you know what? I should add one asterisk. I've had one experience where I felt like I was visited. Really? Yes, but I was on mushrooms. <laughs> if I'm going to be, Brad, I'm going to be. Does not well. It counts in a whole different way, on a whole different level, you know. But I don't know that it counts for ghost cred because I'm. That's a whole different thing. And so if I had all kinds of supernatural experiences, on, you know, that were drug induced, but I don't count them because the thing that about ghosts is that when a ghost intrudes upon a person who is in their, you know, their ordinary state of mind um, and has, and in fact, someone who is super rational, as you seem to be, you seem completely rational. So I, I am fairly rational myself. So I don't think I believe in ghosts and yet have these experiences. So I, I do want to ask you about your experience. What happened? Um, like a, a relative who died showed up and it was like visceral. It was, uh, it was, but it was also, it was also uh, like hard to define visually. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't like a vivid person that showed up. It was the presence. Huh. And so it was kind of like inarguable in the moment, but then after the fact, you know, these things get slippery, but, it's just the closest I've ever come. And in the moment that it was happening, it was entirely convincing. But I'm also a rational enough person to be like, maybe my serotonin receptors were just firing like crazy and something, you know, went wild in my circuitry because of these mushrooms or something. And, you know, I'm prepared for that to be the explanation. But man, it was pretty intense and, and uh, believable. Well, now I'm more, um, now I'm more persuaded that you may have had a, a true supernatural experience because this is something that um, one reads about over and over or hears about from other people. And that is the strange tendency that human beings have to cast some sort of energy toward other people when they've died or when they're in trouble or when they're ill or when they're asking for help. That, that, that's the that's the basis of so many so many encounters with spirits or ghosts so maybe it was maybe yeah. maybe and i think i'm 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 kind of like you at least from what i've gleaned on the page and what i've gleaned in my prep in that when it comes to things like god spirits the supernatural that which we cannot see however you want to phrase it i'm really comfortable in my uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, like I don't have certainty either way. Like I'm not like a, there's no such thing. And I'm also not like a, a totally hardcore believer with like a, uh, you know, just like a doubtless believer. Uh, am I, is that, is that an accurate comparison? That's totally accurate. Yeah. I think, I think that having, um, and really cherishing the fact that you have doubt is important, especially in an age where we see so much utter certainty, self-convinced certainty about various subjects and various things. I, I really value doubt. The sentence is telling a ghost story of a kind, as I, as I was saying. And I have to say, your book surprised me a lot in the best way, in the sense that like, you know, I thought it was doing one thing and then it started doing something else and then it started doing something else. And as it did these different things, I wound up discovering that they were working in concert with each other at like odd angles or angles that surprised me. And it accumulated power. The story accumulated power for me as it went. And it became like more than the sum of its parts. And I, I guess maybe what I'm describing is what any good novel should probably do. But this one did it extra for me like usually i feel like i can see see things coming and and with this hmm. one i was genuinely surprised so thank you for that oh you're welcome uh so you started it and so how how did this go how did this what were you expecting and then what changed and i mean i'm curious well the book the book begins with a description of tookie is it tookie or tookie <laughs> 
Tookie. Tookie, yeah. So Tookie <laughs> is uh, telling the story of her incarceration. Your narrator was incarcerated, and I will not uh, spoil it. I will not spoil for people how the incarceration, you know, what the details of the incarceration were. But, you know, I was kind of following along that story. And then, you know, it shifts to a different phase of her life where she's working in a bookstore. And it becomes this really lovely kind of ode to books and to book culture. Good, this, is, this is a love letter to books and book culture. And, and, it, oh, it and it's also a very contemporary book. A lot of the literary references in it are very contemporary, which I appreciated. Oh, good. And then the book shifts into, you know, a kind of a, a family story. There's family drama. And then it also shifts into a, an even more contemporary telling of the times that we have just lived through historically um, in the world, but as I think in particular as Americans. And then in particular, as people who live in the cities, as you uh, yes. say it, you know, people who live in the Twin Cities. And Minneapolis, right. And it was very interesting to me to see the times that we've just lived in rendered vividly in a fiction, especially on the ground in Minneapolis, you know, where so much of the drama kind of found its focus. Mm -hmm. So, and, and like, I'm missing things. There's a lot of other stuff in the book too. But these are some of the bigger threads in it. And, you know, one is tied to the next, but I didn't necessarily see it coming. So I, I don't know if that describes it well for you, like my reading experience, but. Oh, it does. I, I, I really appreciate you telling me that because I didn't know if they would all work together. But I did want to shift the ground under people because it was, it's going to be a ghost story, right? So you, there are certain expectations, right? So, but then it starts as a, a crime story. I think, I don't think it's actually spoiling it to say what the crime was, just not what made it worse. Well, I'll let, I'll let you say it. I'm, I'm that way. If you want, no, you, if you, you can say it. The crime, <laughs> the crime was that Tookie transported, am I allowed to say transported a body? Yeah, you could say just body snatched. Body snatched. It, body snatched. Yeah, there was a, a dead body that she moved. Let's put it that way. All right. That was it. Yes. And so that, because I think it's important anyway, because that sets up why she's going to be haunted by more than the ghost that haunts her from the bookstore. And I, yeah, I'm sorry. There's certain things that have to be said, you know, that she's being haunted in the bookstore. and. And that she gets the job because she's read in prison with, as she says, murderous attention. Right. Which I wish I had, by the way. When I read that line, I was like, damn, I wish I had murderous attention. <laughs> I feel like, I, I feel like my, <laughs> my attention is often too scattered, you know, when I'm reading. I, I wish I could yeah. be one of those people who just like sits down and like reads like a 500 page book in a sitting or, you know, just can lock in. I wish I had more of that. You do? I do. Well, this has been a time when it's very hard to focus in general. In fact, in writing this book, I found it very hard to focus on the writing. And it was difficult because it was in real time, parts of it, where I began to describe things that were actually happening. In fact, because I started it a lot earlier, I started it maybe in 2014. The book, I, I kept dropping the book because something else would happen. You know, something would come along and I'd think, ah. So I had it on the back burner for quite a while. And I decided in 2019 that I would, November of 2019, it always had to be an All Souls Day. I had to start it and that I would not turn away from it, that I would write whatever happened. 2020. So that's how it came about that it had to encompass everything that happened. But that was tremendously difficult. And I had a lot of trouble focusing, as you said, on with everything happening. I had trouble with the focus that one should have 
on, on writing. I had to try and absorb what was going on before I'd had a chance to really deeply experience it. Well, that's part of the creative risk of the book. Yeah. Is that you're processing these very momentous times, like more or less in real time. And, you know, on the one hand, I think, oof, you know, like, like you said, there's not enough time to process. You know, like sometimes you need time to sort of make sense of what happened, especially when it's a big something that has happened. Right. On the other hand, there is a vitality, I think, to your book and to the telling of it, an immediacy, like a, an, an emotional reality to, say, the George Floyd protests in Minneapolis that right. I'm not sure if, had you written about them three years after the fact, that they would have had that same energy, you know? So it's kind of a give and take, I would say. Right. I think you're right. And I could only do that through the lens of these characters. So it's about how Tookie ex experiences this with her former tribal police officer husband. So there's a lot about policing that it was already going to be an issue. And then this happened and it becomes a, a much deeper issue for the two of them, right? So somehow without knowing it, I'd set up the book to to be kind of a referendum on some of the issues that came up. And sometimes I think when you're working consistently, like, you know, there's, there's the, uh, the adage about just needing to show up at the page or at the keyboard or whatever it is. And if you do right. that, if you do that consistently, then good things will likely happen. Life will present you or your research will present you or, you know, side reading will present you with certain synchronicities that seem, right. that seem pretty uncanny. You know, it's like, wow. Um, and now all of this stuff is sort of pulling together and coming into focus. And maybe you could rationalize it away as like an accident, but sometimes I feel like it, it can seem meant to be, you know, and it does like you were maybe preparing, like you started the book, you said in 2014, and then you had to put it down. And the reason you had to put it down is because other events needed to sort of coalesce in order for whatever you had going to crystallize. I, I find this all the time. I'm writing and I write something that I think is outrageous and could never happen. And then I do research and I find that I have exactly described something that either happened or could happen. That if you're tuned in, as you say, sometimes the fiction you write becomes corroborated by the research you do. And when that happens, it, it gives me a, a real, a great feeling of connectedness and a sense that I'm on the right path and all that you can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. It's like affirmation. It's like, okay, I'm not, I'm not barking up the wrong tree. You know, I'm doing you know. the right thing. And right. there's also auto, there's auto fiction, auto fictional elements to this book. Uh, the book is set at least partially in a bookstore called Birch Bark Books, which I know corresponds with your own actual lived life. You have a, a bookstore in Minneapolis called Birch Bark Books. Yes, although it's never in the finished copy, we never, I never name it. It's kind of obvious, isn't it? <laughs> you know what? It's so obvious that I just conflated the two in my brain. Of course, it's pretty obvious. It's got a confessional in it. So yeah, only a few, a, a, I'd say, you know, a few bookstores must have confessionals, but I don't know any others. Anyway, so yes, it has an emphasis on native writing. And there is a character named Louise in the book it's kind of in the background background not very not very influential at all but, but somehow there. kind of funny though i thought i found i mean as this was my read of it is like almost like you like alfred hitchcock like making a cameo in your own book <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my my shadow against the shades right it, it was it was fun to put that in and like i was saying earlier you know this book the sentence is really a love letter to books and book culture, to booksellers. Like I have bookseller friends of mine who I want to read this book. Oh, good. Because I haven't read too many books. I'm trying to think through my, you know, my reading past about books that might have book selling in them so prominently. And there are a lot. Yeah. No. And like, it's like such a great celebration, like the banter. And there's a pride that I recognize on the page in your book 
that corresponds very well to the conversations I've had with bookseller friends of mine. Like mm -hmm. booksellers love books so much and they love to recommend books. They love to match make, you know, <laughs> like they love it when they can, you know, hand someone a book that they themselves love, you know, all those kinds of things felt very true to life to me. And it's kind of a subtle art, you know, the art of book selling. And there's a, a particular type of person who matches well with that line of work. And I thought that you captured it beautifully. I, I, I love when I get to go in and when I find someone looking around, I'm always kind of looking for someone who wants help finding, choosing a book. Anyway, those are wonderful moments. And I really love being able to interest someone in a book and for them to then get back in touch and say it was a great read and then suggest another book back. You know, writing is a reclusive life and I'm not a very outgoing person. So I think when I started this story, I was hoping that there would be literary conversations. You know, I was just, there will be literary conversations. But I didn't want to be in a book club because then I would have to read on you know, command sort of that sort of thing. So I wanted to have these spontaneous literary conversations and that worked to my joy get to have those conversations all the time and with especially with other booksellers the people who who work in the store i'm very close to them they're they are tremendously important to me all the people who work in the store and we have we talk about books all the time and we you know argue about them right now of course we're talking about whether we're going to whether the how the the movie of Dune is going to affect our reading of Dune, and you know we're we're all going through this whole thing. But um, from time to time, something comes up, and, and we most of us read it, and so or one person becomes a very strong advocate for one of the books. I think Anthony became a strong advocate for the Ocean Vong book, and we all influence one another. It's it's kind of it's wonderful to have that as a community. Com thank you. Right. It's culture too. Uh, you know, we have a culture in our bookstore, and we have a little community and a culture, and it's all around these certain books that, that we like or tend to dislike, like you know, or books that we argue about. Yeah. As I, as I listen to you talk, like, first of all, you said you're not like a super social person. I think that would describe me. Like, I think, I mean, I can do it, but mm -hmm. I get tired. <laughs> and I think a lot of people feel that way. I think especially maybe a lot of writers, but you have built your community. You have built this little cultural community at your bookstore that feeds that part of you. I would right. say, I'm sure. And you also have like a vibrant family life. I know from reading about yes. you, like you have lots of kids, uh, Very, yes, close knit. Yes. So you have all this stuff going on. Listen, I have two kids that eats up a lot of my energy for any socializing, you know, like I, I Completely. you know, like I don't feel lonely, you know, like I have plenty to do and plenty to talk, you know, people talking to me all the time. But when I was listening to you talk about the bookstore in particular, as an outlet for social life and community and cultural dialogue and exchange, I was recognizing myself in this podcast in it because I often joke that this is my social life. You know, I talk to writers and I get to have these kind of long form conversations and it feeds a certain part of me that needs nourishing. So I completely understand how you would find that so wonderful. And I've had the fantasy as have, I think most writers of having their own bookstore. So kudos to you for pulling it off. I think it's such a lovely thing to do is to, make a bookstore and build one of those communities wherever you happen to live and to like use it as a, a kind of home base for book people, but also as a, as like a, a feeder to the community because a bookstore is more than just a place to buy books. It also becomes, I think, a place to educate. It becomes a place for schools to connect with books and to get those books to their students. And, you know, there's all sorts of different functions that it can perform. Yes. And when you walk into a bookstore, you know that most of the people in the bookstore are of the 
the same, that same curiosity, have that same sort of, they're looking for a book. There's, that, that, isn't, that isn't everybody, right? We've had proposals in the bookstore, you know, romance. It's, it's, it's fairly romantic, a small bookstore. And people come just because they like to be in a bookstore with other readers, but not have to interact with them. You know, you don't have to state your views. Right. You can just be in this, it's like parallel play as you're looking through the books. And people come into bookstores because they they do want to find a book to read and they want some, they they may not want to be um, steered by an algorithm. And I, I, I think we have seen the dangers of being steered by an algorithm toward what, what you already know and what you already want to read and what you already want to see. So one of the things I think bookstores really do is to present a, a range of new ideas and new views and allow human human serendipity to guide to guide your hand to guide your eye you know there's something so important about that and then other people in bookstores are always recommending books to one another too i see that absolutely i mean now you say human serendipity i think part of human serendipity is meeting that bookseller who happens yeah. to be able to kind of like match you up perfectly or standing right. next to somebody in whatever section you're looking, you know, whatever section of the store you're in and having that person just say, I just finished this. It was great. And then you pick it up, you know? Right. Right. Isn't that, isn't that right? And it, the, the great thing is too, is that you really have, because the books are there, you don't have to search around for a topic if you want to address somebody else. Now I sound like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of going, this is the, <laughs> don't bumble, don't go on all of these matchmaking, just go to your small bookstore. <laughs> there, there's a great, and you, it, yeah. there's a great you line. Know. There's a great line in the book um, and I'm going to paraphrase it. So forgive me, but you're yeah. talking about the bookstore in the book and it's like, you know, a, a small sacred space that, you know, like what it had like the same f the feeling of a place that's about to be like crushed by encroaching capitalism or something. <laughs> oh yes. I was looking. It has the doomed romance of a place that is about to be consumed by um, unfettered capitalism or something like that. Yes, it has that except that it's not a doomed romance. What's what quite wonderful to me, one of the things that was reassuring about people during this pandemic was that they turned in such great numbers to books and to physical books. There's something very comforting about a book. And what I think is that it is like a fork or a spoon, that it's, it's one of our sort of er technologies. It's one of our you know, even if it was clay tablets or whatever it was, whatever you were reading, it was a book. And this particular iteration of a book, I would say basically the trade paperback is some of the, one of the best. I mean, you know, a nice sturdy paperback, which is not too expensive, but not, you know, it has, it has beautiful, clear, legible type and a beautiful cover. Fits in your hands. You can drop it. You're not out, you know, a um, hundred bucks. You can, I mean, you can um, drop in the bathtub. It, it's, 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 it's a really good piece of technology, and it smells. Books smell good. People have a. Um, there's even a perfume called paperback. You know, pe people are attracted to that, that smell of paper, and um, I guess it has vanilla sort of. People say it smells, vaguely like vanilla. Anyway, I think people began to, to. Um, like books and miss small bookstores because we began to have a a tremendous interest in the bookstore. We didn't think we would survive in the beginning. I mean, nobody was anywhere. Nobody was, everybody was totally 
traumatized in shock, as you, as you know. I mean, nobody knew what to do. But then uh, bookstores were declared essential by, uh, at least Minnesota declared them essential. So we could stay open and we could provide curbside uh, delivery. So people are, you know, people could come by and, and get books. I know some places like the Raven Bookstore in, in Lawrence, Kansas, they were delivering books to people, which is pretty wonderful. So they even had a, a oh, sorry, a, a t-shirt with a pizza delivery box, a Raven and a book. I mean, it was really, they were, they were doing this great delivery. So bookstores did all sorts of things to, to stay, stay in touch with our customers. And by customers, I mean, fellow readers. I mean, yes, it's a transactional um, relationship, but it's more than that. It's also an interaction that is based on um, the love of books. That's like a form of sustenance, you know, maybe especially in times of oh, crisis, like you know. Yeah. Did you, so. did you guys have like an uptick in sales? Like did business boom during? Eventually, eventually it did. You know, at first we were, uh, it was like the Louise in the, in the, the book, in the sentence is uh, sending out long discursive emails, you know, we're going to make it, we're going to do this, you know, <laughs> we're going to stick together, we're going to get through it. And thinking, meanwhile, to myself, this is, it, we're not, we're, we're going to collapse at last. We've been here 20 years, but this is it. How can we get through this? However, our customers really remembered us and came through. We, we, we did manage to survive. That's wonderful. And Doing I love hearing, well. I love hearing stories like that. And yeah. it's also, it's heartening when that sort of like business to customer exchange or customer to business exchange happens where you provide a valuable service to the community. I would say a bookstore, like especially an indie bookstore is as benevolent as it gets when it comes to like a capitalist undertaking, right? I mean, you're a bookstore, come on. And if you're there and you're doing the work and you're genuine in your affection for books and trying to get the word out about the ones that you love and, and you're yeah. open to those dialogues with customers, it's heartening to think that when things got tough, that the customers remembered that. And, you know, I heard that same sort of story told about like beloved restaurants, you know, right, we had, right. we had places of same business way. in our neighborhood that were like, look, we're going under unless you guys help us out. And my local indie bookstore, like they asked for, what was it like $25 a year in annual dues, like membership. And yeah. Everybody did that, you know, like a lot of people stepped in and were like, yeah, you, we don't want you to go away. You know, we, we, oh, we want yeah. you to stick around. I, I, I found that so heartening. There, there were a lot of things that came out of this that were, that, that, that gave me just this sense of um, connection with other people. As disconnected as I am normally, <laughs> but right. it gave me a great sense of, of uh, I, I, I felt like I was becoming more cheerful and more positive when everything was, when, there were some terrible things that happened in, in our family and w around us, but I also, and, and horrible things that happened in Minneapolis, absolutely um, horrifying. And yet, there were also these signs of, of uh, was it? There's these signs of power and ferocity for life, and I began to, I began to feel unlike myself. I began to feel a positive. <laughs> My pessimism began to fade. I began to really feel more more optimistic about people in terms of and, and the the um the protests help I'd say were a big part of that because 
this was a general uprising for justice and it was huge. It went all, it started to go all over the world. And I thought, this is a, this is, I know there are so many beginnings, there's so many starts. It happens over and over, but it seems to me that they all build on, the one builds on the next, you know? So it's kind of wretched to have hope, but that's what, that's what I came out with. There is a, uh, another line I loved in the book that I recognize myself in, where Tookie is talking about the world as it uh, adapts to COVID and how it's emptier and slower and how in some ways it feels like the world she'd always sort of secretly wanted. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I had that same feeling, especially in those early first days where it, there was so much uncertainty and kind of lack of right. knowledge about what, what was this thing and how, right. how did it pass from one person to the next and kind of traffic was off the roads in Los Angeles, which is always really noticeable. And I could ride my bike without feeling like I was going to get hit, you know, <laughs> like, and so there, I recognize myself in that because I loved when things slowed down. I wasn't put off by that at all. I was like, oh, this is nice. And you talk about running a bookstore in COVID and how you sort of crystallized that bookstores are an essential service for people. They, they offer a form of sustenance for people, especially I think in difficult times. And I think if there's, positives that came out of this past you know and we're still in it but you know that came out of this era it might be the sense of social awakening and activism and understanding that we have to take responsibility ourselves in the face of injustice you know like the george floyd protests i think crystallized that for a lot of us but when it comes to covid i think that the turning inward that it enforced upon us. Maybe there's a lot of positive in that, you know, maybe we needed to turn inward myself included, you know, like you get so busy in life and it's very easy to kind of get caught up in the static and this sort of enforced slowness and quiet and solitude. Right. There was that, but there was also a, so I, 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 I absolutely hear what you say and against the backdrop of that there's this absolute terror because my sisters and brothers are in health care services so they were on the front lines so so i think people always also had this knowledge that we could see who was saving us at all times we could see who was saving us in the medical profession we could see how dependent how utterly dependent we were how vulnerable we could also see that this idea that uh somehow we had to shut our borders when we were being saved at every turn by delivery people who were working in great danger in great danger too, I mean, and working their hearts out to bring people essential food and medication and everything people needed. You know, we, we could see who we were depending on. And I, I think, and I hope that that, that that won't, that won't fade away because it's, and it is still ongoing. I mean, what we have now is I feel like COVID has left of course, a long trail, not only in that the, the disease is still here, but also it's left a long trail of trauma and of dislocation and disorientation and people who understand work in a different way as well. I mean, it, it, it has changed so much. And people also, I think, have a much more uh, serious regard for what climate change can do, what climate chaos can do, because we've seen how quickly things change, and that's what that's what we're talking about. I mean, things change on a dime, and that's what climate chaos does. And I think people are beginning to be rightly uh, 
terrified, but also taking a stand and seeing what they can, seeing what we can do and seeing what the most important step is that each person can take. I think everybody has kind of a coming to understanding. And I, I see people all the time saying, you know, this really hit me. And I realized that there was something big that I could actually do. And then either joining with uh, a much bigger cause or doing something that was going to make a huge difference. Or like, yeah, making a career shift, all these different things. And man, right. listening to you talk, I could not help but be just reminded of the magnitude of all that we've been through. Like there's so much it's to so process, cute. there's so much to process. And only just beginning to kind of wrap my head around the grief and the, the collective trauma, but also just the individual traumas, people who've suffered incredible losses. Yes. How is this uh, pandemic, how are the years of this pandemic over the long haul and the, tra and the associated traumas going to affect healthcare workers for the long term? I mean, it's not like, it's not like you just go through this and then it passes. Like the experiences that these healthcare workers have been through uh, in particular, you know, for the past couple of years, like that's going to be something they're going to be reckoning with for the rest of their lives. You have to believe. I'm seeing that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and what is it to, I mean, I, I feel like young people who are going into healthcare right now are seeing, um, are are doing with this this a very different understanding of what can be asked of them you know this was this was people being asked to treat people for an illness that in many cases would probably kill them people who before people had any personal protection you know, this was something that has not been seen in our time, in, in our parents' time. You know, this is this is an, something we can't. You know, the thing I I keep coming back to is people saying. Some people are saying, you know, I just never want to think about this time again. But I really think we need to think about this time. We need to take in the lessons. They're very very important deep lessons and i don't know about you but do you feel like oh, this is the beginning of something that could go so many ways i have that yeah do you have that absolutely thing? absolutely i mean like that's maybe where the optimist in me comes in but i also think it's it's rational because the story's not written yet and i you know i don't know everything but i do know that you know, when there's crisis and big upheaval, often it leads to new growth, right? Or like a forest, like a major forest fire, you know, leads to new growth. Right. It, it can be a long haul. It's not going to change for the better overnight. But, right. you know, there are opportunities in this if we can see them and take advantage of them. And, you know, I feel as a parent, maybe in particular, I don't have the luxury of defeatism. I think there, it would be immoral for me to wallow. You know, I always kind of have to choose to believe that there's a better way forward. That doesn't mean I don't see the, the wrong or I don't see what's dark. I don't see the darkness, but I just can't quit, I guess is what I'm saying. I feel an obligation. I feel an obligation to go forward and to try to yeah. make things better. And I think, I think I, I, you know, I say that as a parent as well, but also I think as a human being, that is the way to be. Because, you know, sometimes people get, um, people begin to see our, uh, ourselves, our, our general condition as something that's so awful that why wouldn't we just be erased off the face of the earth? But what I see is this extraordinary This, this might be a moment of extraordinary growth for us in general. I mean, because not only the growth of the art that's come out of this time, the, the passion, the, the, the 
thirst for justice, the, the community, the beauty, I, the art that's come out of this has been extraordinary. The music, you know, the things, the writing, the, all the things that make us human. Um, the teachers, the teachers who have persisted and put everything into their students. I mean, there's been, there's been the, the medical people. I, you know, this is, this is something I feel like we have to, um, we, we have to believe, not just believe, but we have to act on this belief. You know, that this is something that unfortunately brings me to politics. I mean, right now we're, we're so dependent for the future of, it seems crazy to me that the actual future of humanity hinges on a few elected officials. Right. It seems this is the madness. So what I've started to put my energy in, um, I've always been um, active, uh, but now it's on getting everybody to vote and putting my energy into these these umbrella organizations that support small get out the vote movements that operate year round and just get just the right to vote and that's that's all we got that's what we got because we need policy right we need policy right now more than anything we need policy to fix this so it's not political, really. It's a matter of survival. It's all, yeah. It's, what you're talking about, I think, is you said voting rights and getting the out, you know, getting out the vote. That's democracy. <laughs> it's just what we're supposed to be. Yeah, it's democracy. Yeah. We're trying to I mean, uphold democracy, and and you know, people who would make that political, it's like, well, wait, you know, we, you do realize we're trying to protect the vote for everyone, not just so, you know. Yeah. No, this is this is really absolutely true, but we are seeing that there's a, there's a very um, strong, strong movement toward autocracy and toward dismantling democracy. And we, we can only do that by getting everybody to vote. You know, we know that we have a democracy that leans heavily toward uh, a much smaller population than our general population. But we do have two Democrats who are standing in the way of what could be a world a world ending project. I mean this is this is this is unbearable. It's unbelievable. It's it's what but this is where we are. And the only thing I can think of to do is to continue to try and um, get more Democrats into office so that we don't have two people standing in the way of fixing climate change. That's right. And uh, for those of you listening, Joe Manchin's phone number is 202-224-3954. And I know this by heart because I call him all the time. And Kirsten Cinema's number is 202-224-3954. 4521. Call them daily. It takes two sec, you know, two minutes. Leave them a message. Pressure works, I think. At least I, I choose to believe that if enough of us make enough noise, they're gonna have no choice but to hear us. And so and, and so I will just say um, movement voter project. Movement voter project is the umbrella group I'm talking about that nurtures and funds small on the ground grassroots vote get out the vote movements and in large part was responsible in Georgia for electing Democrats and cinema <laughs> and basically elected cinema, which you know whatever we think it, so um, but this but could elect someone else next time, right? So it's 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 these small it's this umbrella group that funds these small year round people who have or they're, they're not people who just go in every election cycle and pop in suddenly 
the people who are always there, always working, always figuring out how to get more people to vote. What could be more democratic? Yeah. More, more the merrier. Let's all vote. Yeah. And this figures, you know, I know we're, we're talking about politics and activism and all these things, but it definitely figures into your book. The George Floyd murder yeah. and the George Floyd protests figure in as we were talking about COVID figures in as we've been discussing. All of these things are of a piece in the times that we live in. And I couldn't help and I, this might be a little bit too cute, but I couldn't help but feel when I tried to consider your book, uh, you know, in total, you know, it's a ghost story. It's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's about a haunting. <laughs> and in, right. in a way, we kind of live in uh, times that feels, I think, arguably sort of haunted. Um, and there's a kind of feeling of wanting to exercise demons. You know, like, again, this might be too cute in terms of an assessment, but you see the, the, the point that I'm trying to make. I mean, it felt that way it to is. me. It I, is. Absolutely. No, that's an absolutely exactly the reading that how it it became a book that was haunted on increasing an increasing number of levels Um, haunted by racism haunted by dispossession haunted by uh, and 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 throughout people are talking haunted by history but you know and i think about now we are the people who are whatever we do is going to haunt the future we're the ghosts who are go- whose actions are going to mean that people have a livable world or don't have a livable world. Right. So the haunting is a, a, a haunting of of humanity. I mean, this is this is what history is. This is what we're all in it together, and we're all we're all in a world where. Uh, we we haunt one another in all sorts of ways. You know, there's there is um, there's so many levels this plays out on. You know, it's funny. I haven't even we haven't even talked about race. I mean, I guess George Floyd, but I'm talking about like the native protagonist of the book, Tookie, her yeah. family history. The bookstore itself is a native bookstore. The people who work there are um, mostly native. The the ghost in question. I'm not going to no spoilers. We'll, we'll I guess we'll let the the readers the readers find out. <laughs> that's okay. Out. That's in the two first few pages. Yeah, yeah. So you know, there's a uh, there's all that there's that whole layer playing out as well. Yeah. And there's so much native history, particularly regionally, like the Chippewa. You know, uh, yeah, the Dakota, the Dakota, Dakota yeah, all that history in in Minnesota and in the Upper Midwest, right, is interwoven throughout the book as well, and kind of, it's like a lens through which almost it becomes a lens almost through which to view what's happening in real time in the present day. At least yeah. that was my take on it. You know, it kept those kind of things worked in in sort of surprising concert together for me. You know, it was like, oh wow, there's resonances here that. I could kind of almost like feel you discovering on the page, you know, how that's some, you know, it's true. Yeah. I was, I was kind of, uh, I could sense like the excitement in the writing, which is always fun. And, uh, you know, I want to be sensitive to your time. I know we've been talking for a bit, but I I don't want to let you leave without asking you a little bit about process because so many people who listen to my show are writers or aspiring writers. Okay. And you're so prolific and you have had, objectively, I would say, the kind of career that just about every person who sets out to write literary fiction would love to have. You've written a lot of books. They've found an audience. You've written a lot of different kinds of books. Um, And yet, you know, your body of work feels like it's unified. It's been, um, you've received awards, (laughs) like recognition. I know that stuff doesn't matter the most, but it does it's the kind of thing people dream about is my point. You know, you've lived a big artistic life in the, in the way that I think most writers imagine it. Lots of books published, you know, readers, awards, all that kind of stuff. But you've also had a big family life. Right. You know, and sometimes I think people sort of divide those two. You can have one or the other. You've had both, <laughs> which adds questions like, how do you get it all done uh, amid all of all that you have going on. So I just love to hear you talk about your work habits and 
how you feel you've been able to be so prolific? I don't have a real work habit. I, I, I love, I love to write. I keep notebooks. Um, I feel surprised by this myself because this has happened most of my writing life. I've been a single mother, single mother as well. So this has been the backdrop of the whole thing. I can just say it's probably sheer madness and complete, you know, a breakdown of, of, um, every rule of housekeeping one could imagine. <laughs> there, is, there is really no strict rule about how everything has to go. But I, I would say that the two things that were most important for me were deciding that my children came first, my daughters, my door was never closed. They never had to be quiet. They had they could have any pet they wanted. I didn't have a lot of discipline because I didn't have time for discipline. That was maybe a mistake, but everybody survived the lack of discipline <laughs> and madness. <laughs> and we just had a wild time. But my other my other thing f- foremost was I would not think about appearances. I would just write. I would not think about whether I had a good idea. I would just write it. I would not think about whether I was capable. I would just put my pen on the page. And if I had an idea at any point and I was tired, I would write it anyway. And that's one of the hardest things to do for me is I'm, you know, you're doing something else, you're exhausted, wake up in the middle of the night, you got to write. You can't give yourself an out. I didn't give myself an out. And it, so it's not, it, it was never easy uh, to do. But on the other hand, I really love doing it. It's not like it's work exactly, but it's something that you just can't let yourself you can't you can't let yourself argue with your your writer the writer has to be you have to listen to the writer at all times and that's all i can say so just to be clear there's no regular writing routine it's whenever you could do it absolutely you don't need to be in your office you do not need to be you know you don't need quiet you don't need you know, you're going to have to give up all those wonderful ideas of being, you know, hermetically sealed. And, you know, I listen to all, I I read all these, I just finished The Magician, you know, the Colm Toybean book about Thomas Mann and about how he had these specific times, how the silence had to be maintained, blah, blah, blah. And also Frank Herbert, silence, you know, he had to be, who present company accepted who are these guys who are these guys who get to have that right (laughs) who are these writers who get to have they have what they are is they're people with wives and i really wanted a wife (laughs) 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 in the most i wanted a you know for a while i i was married but that was not that did not work out that way but I wanted that sort of partner who would take care of everything, right? Anybody would. But that's that's wrong to have to relegate someone to to that um to that role where you just take care of everything. And also you it, it it I feel like I can see it in the writing a lot with some of the quote unquote great writers. I can see that they were not challenged on a number number of levels where i can see female writers were challenged on the levels that meant that they were taking care of themselves or they were failing and i certainly have failed many times to adequately adequately care for myself you know care for 
you know, God knows, family, everything that I wish I had had more time to do. But somehow it, it's a creaky ship and stove in a lot of places, but we're still floating. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, what I'm hearing is, is that, you know, the, the very fact of the busyness of your life, all the different demands on your time and attention, that enforces a certain kind of focus. I think yeah. the hard part is that discipline of always paying heed to your writer, even if it's three in the morning and you're exhausted. Like that's the hard part is to just develop that, that discipline and to be fierce uh, about it. But I, I always make the comparison of like when I was in college and I had like a lot of courses, I always did better in the semesters where I took more classes is the point. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and I think if you have too much time or, you know, too many options and too many, you know, the circumstances are too perfect, sometimes that can be detrimental. And it sounds to me like, you know, you have this drive to write and there are certain pockets of time in your life that you're able to do it and you've just always done it. And that's the key. You just always. And one, one thing I think that's really hard is this, this thing, uh, I guess it's called cognitive dissonance when you are engaged in one task and then you have an idea and you have to shift your mind over to that idea, you know, it's something to get used to. It's something that it, it, it almost hurts to want to be writing, but to have to be attending to some other task that is, is, is really important for your kids, you know? So, um, you have to find a place to stash those ideas. It's like a mental file where you can put them. Or, I mean, I've got the beginnings of books that are on the back of kids' homework, on, uh, you know, restaurant napkins while they were eating, <laughs> while we went out somewhere, whatever or on the back of um, just all kinds of scrap paper because you don't have to write on regular paper. You don't have to write, you don't have to also use a computer all the time. I mean, that's one of the things that I think can also hamper a writer. Having to open a computer means you suddenly have to be looking at a, you know, a, a, an expensive piece of equipment, right? you have to have it in your hands. Your, your kid might throw milk on it. Uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> might kill your computer. So, and you might not write. Right. But it's just a piece of crappy paper. <laughs> There's nothing they can really do. So, you know, get used to also writing on um, anything. So do you write, but you, I've read that you write longhand. You write the first draft of your books longhand. Is that correct? Yes. And it's not a pretty process. I'm, uh, what I'm saying is like, some of the some of the longhand is written on, you know, like trash. So, <laughs> yeah, paper bags, whatever. And then the, another thing that I read about your process, and I, I definitely felt this in the sentence, is that there's like a a lot of times the way in for you is through voice. Um, you, you'll hear the voice of a character and you'll get into, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it into a kind of trance state where you're channeling this voice. Um, is yeah. that a consistent thread from book to book or at least most of your books? And if so, um, can you just talk a little bit about how you get there? I imagine it's a little bit mysterious, but I, I can imagine listeners being like, yeah, but how do I get into the trance state? <laughs> <laughs> well it's really not when you have uh, other um, you have to have that time so when you have that time and it's like getting into what people call the flow the flow state in dance or or in um, art or whatever you're doing I mean I think I think a person gets there by practicing really hard. Unfortunately, it's not a magical state that comes over you if you, you know, splash 
some sort of mineral on your head or whatever, right. you know, or, right. or, or, or put, put your hands in ice. I don't know. What would you do? But it's from practicing a lot. Flow always comes out of practice. Just showing up and doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Showing up when, when the, showing up all the time, you know, being ready. I think that's the most important thing. I did have a really good um, professor when I was in college who said something about uh, just keeping the door open all the time. And I, I, I really took that in. You, you don't close the door, even if you're doing something else or you're supposed to be, just keep the door open. That's a motif. I mean, if I may, that's a motif in the sentence. That idea appears. So it's funny, you know, like something your teacher said to you when you were in college is carried through your entire life. It has, except that those those two sentences are actually in the dictionary that I talk about at the end of the book. Um, I don't know if you have the hardcover or the reading copy, but I have a reader uh, uncorrected yeah. proof. Yeah. So the, the the first line of the book is in prison. While in prison, I received a dictionary. So it turns out that dictionary has actually been really important to me all my life, that particular dictionary. And I feel the same way about dictionaries as about small bookstores. I mean, you go to look for a word on a dictionary as opposed to um, looking it up online. And you're going to find a bunch of other words because it's, it, it's, you're never going to page to the right word right automatically. So it's, it's, it's like being led down a path. And, and I, I still have my dictionary. From um, I was given this dictionary by the National Football League. I was in a contest why I want to go to college. And I won this dictionary from the National Football League. So I kept it all my life. I have never met anybody who has a dictionary that was given to them by the National Football League. You are the first person. I... I probably was one of the few, uh, and one of the few left because I think they stopped the. <laughs> it's a very it's a valuable did. artifact. <laughs> Sadly, if only they did. Um, last thing I'll say about your writing process uh, has to do with being prolific, because this is another common question for writers. It's it's one thing to do it once, you know, you get a book done, but then to keep going. And to keep finding inspiration and to be productive and to build a career, which you've managed to do in a very difficult business. It's not, it is difficult. It's not the normal course of events to, to make a career out of literary fiction and nonfiction and poetry, but you've done it. And then I think about this process and how you've, you've always got stuff going so that when you finish a book, I'm imagining if there's some system of organization to it, or at least you know where things are. You can turn to your piles of paper and start to kind of sift through the rubble for the next idea. Is that what it looks like when you're transitioning from one project to the next? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, I have notebooks. So if I, I always have a notebook wherever I go, I have one in my purse or, you know, whatever I've got. Um, I usually do. I don't always, but almost always. And so a lot of those ideas are in these notebooks and, um, I start what my daughter calls crawling around on the floor, but literally I am crawling around the floor looking through the notebooks at the pieces of paper, seeing where there is some kind of congruence. I usually have, I have lots of lists of set of uh, lists of titles and I usually write a book to a title. I have a, a title that starts sticking out of the others and then I it kind of attracts ideas and anecdotes pieces of history characters it, it's funny to hear you talking about this because I, I'm thinking of you writing it all down on paper I'm thinking of me doing most of it on my computer and just recently I was going through old files on my computer as one sometimes does. And I sort of got into a folder where a lot of my new book lives. 
or has lived through the years. And I was astonished at how messy it was. How many, <laughs> like how many different iterations, things I didn't even remember. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? And so I think like, it was very easy for me to forget all of it because it just lives on some hard drive in a folder on my computer. But to see, to see it with actual paper, <laughs> I'm imagining like you must have situations uh, unfold for yourself creatively where you'll have like a one piece of paper where you've got, you know, idea A jotted down. And then you've got this title in mind that you're kind of writing toward that you feel a certain attraction to. And then under another pile of pages, you'll find another disparate idea that suddenly has a certain resonance with idea A. And then you find the line of connectivity to the title and you're almost collaging it in that way. Right. Is that, am I on the right track? I mean, it just, Oh yeah. It just seems like uh, it's, it seems like maybe we forget how messy the creative process is, how necessarily messy it is. Like we want for it to be so neat, but it never is, you know? No, it's not. And um, it, and it's absolutely looks like that. My first manuscripts are on all sorts of paper and they're with, every sort of handwriting and I have sometimes I have um, small bits of paper glued into the text. So it's, it is a collage. Yeah. Mm. But to me, it's, it's, it's easier to do than having it in a computer because I can see it right in front of me and I can, I can really spread it out, you know? So it's a visual, it's a much more visual, has, has a lot more visual impact for me. Are you, are you actually like sitting on the floor, like maybe sequencing things yeah. or putting things, you do all that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, see, this is, I mean, I know this is just your everyday, but this is gold for people listening. And I think like, what a great lesson. Like you who have had this great career, um, have written all these wonderful books, have won all these major awards. This is the process. It's like sitting on the floor with a bunch of scraps of paper and like parsing it out and gluing things. This I mean, is you, it. yeah, this is it. A woman on the floor <laughs> with paper, you know, pieces of paper bags and napkins and, you know, uh, what, and also um, quotes, notes, all kinds of various kinds of paper. I, I and I used to um, collect cheap motel paper, which they don't give out anymore. So it even got to that point where I have a book that's all on motel paper. I hope you've saved this stuff. Do you say? Do you have you saved these? Of like, course, I save all this because I like the look of it. You know, I like the look of the, I like the look of the manuscripts. They are visual. They're tactile. Yeah. You know, you also collect not only that, but I think when you have that kind of, um, I mean, you can, you know, put, you can put pictures and visual things into your manuscript online, but in, in, in your manuscript, but it's not easy. It's not easy. You really have to go to some lengths to do that. When you are just working with a physical manuscript, you can just tape stuff in. You can tape your paintings or, you know, little little things you come across in the newspaper, whatever you find. You just tape it in. And so there's always that kind of reference. I always have a lot of visual references and objects that go with every manuscript. Mm. I think the b- biggest uh, problem with working on a computer for me is the access to the Internet yeah, and the, de- and, and, the de- and the delete key. Yeah, Like you can sit there and I delete, I'll go back and, you know, some of it's good. You get to edit on the fly. But I think if you're working with a physical manuscript, you have less opportunity to erase what you've done. I think you can lose a lot of good stuff that way. I'm sure I've lost a lot of good stuff by doubting myself and then hitting delete or getting distracted and going online, you know, all that kind of stuff that you don't uh-huh. do when you have a notebook in front of you probably. I think that's a problem. Um, I've noticed that too, because after I, you know, at some point I put everything in, in a, into the computer, of course, I'm not going to type everything over. I don't use a typewriter anymore, but at that point that I'm editing on, I, I try not to edit 
I try to do a printout and edit in um, pen or pencil because you write, you lose a lot. And I even look back over old manuscripts and say, I should not have cut that. Or it's usually like, thank God I cut that. But once in a while, you miss something. Right. Print out your manuscript and then go over it. And also, it's important because you're going to make it into a physical book. You know, people are, people are going to want to read a physical book, a lot of them. So it's good to have the tactile quality that people are going to eventually have with this book to see it that way from the outset yeah well i mean not from the very outset but at least if you print out your print out your um, drafts i love this idea of collaging an early draft okay because i think most people think of a first draft they think of you know turning off the editor in your brain writing it without much self-criticism, getting the words down on the page so that you have something to work with. Right, right. But I think what I'm hearing from you is that, yes, there is that, but there is also, maybe there's an, like you'll paste in or include among the sheets of paper, a painting, like a visual, a piece of art or a quote, something to write towards. Like you're almost like sequencing it and piling ideas together interspersed with bits of your own writing and then this the second draft is where you start to draft out of that correct yeah well at least at at least you're going to have so so that you you're always drafting out of the last one you know and in the second draft you're probably going to put it into the computer second or third draft and then it's going to start looking printed but then you go back to it and make it your own by using i mean i you know i have a i i i use different color pens so that i know i'm going to go through it once with a black pen and maybe i'll put all those changes into the computer but then i'm going to go through that same manuscript again with a blue pen and then i'll know that i've got new information that i need to put in the computer right but so i'll keep that that print up because you don't want to print out that many printouts. So, you know, you can keep going with one print up for quite a while if you use different color pens and you, it also begins to feel tactile. You can add, um, you know, uh, whatever visual stuff you want. And, and uh, it just feels like it feels personal that way. Do you work with an editor? I mean, I know you, 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 oh, you yeah. must. So I know for a long time you had the same editor. Do you still have the same editor? Thank or have? You. I still have this wonderful editor, editor Terry Carton. Yeah. Okay. So last question, I promise. <laughs> when you've had as much success as you've had, I guess this having a long standing relationship with an editor makes it possible or maybe more possible for that editor to edit you. Yeah. I wonder that I wonder this about writers sometimes who've you know reached a certain level in their careers like does anybody edit them does anybody come to them especially if this person happens to be younger or something and how does that person go up to Louise and say hey Louise I think you really should reconsider chapter 12 or whatever it is you know do you want that kind of pushback do you get that kind of pushback at this stage or do you feel you've gotten to a point where you're able to self edit pretty well I think when you get, if if you'd get to that point, then you're done as a writer where you don't need somebody to edit you or you don't listen to people who are going to give you some advice about your book. I, I think you're done. I, I, I just think it's, it's a, uh, I mean, I always go and Terry knows this. She has been brutal and I've been, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Because if you've got a good editor, then that person's going to give you honest feedback. Or even if you have an editor who is you don't maybe trust and that person's giving you feedback, but you have enough confidence so they can say yes or no. But never turn down criticism. Never. I mean, I I I I really this book especially really needed a lot of editing and a lot of help a lot of feedback i have uh also trusted readers who read the books and 
really are brutally honest. And that's what that's as important as anything else is really having people who will say this this is this is bad. <laughs> this is not going well for you. Because if you get to the point where you don't listen to that, then really I do think you're over as a writer. Well, we will end on that note. I could talk to you all day long. It's really a joy. It's just a joy to talk to you too. Thank you. Uh, uh, and I, I love the book. Um, is there another one? I'm imagining you've got something in the offing. You're working on stuff all the time. Um, I am, but this is going to be it for a while, as long as I can, <laughs> as long as I can stay away from publishing a book. I'm going to write something that I, I hope I can take more time. On. Okay. Well, Louise, um, great appreciation for your time. Thank you so much. Congratulations thank on you. this new novel and on all the success that you've had in your career. I wish you well. Oh, thank you. It really was a pleasure. All right. There we have it, folks. That is Louise Erdrich. Her new novel is called The Sentence. It is available from Harper. I believe you can find her online on Facebook. If it's not her, there is an author page on Facebook devoted to her. Again, the book is called The Sentence. Go get your copy right now. You can also visit Louise's bookstore, her indie bookstore in Minneapolis, Birchbark Books. The website is birchbarkbooks.com, I believe. What a thrill to get to talk with Louise Erdrich on this program. The Other People podcast is offered freely. Every single episode of this show is available to you, the listener, free of charge. That's more than 700 episodes and counting. Hundreds and hundreds of hours of content, all available to you whenever you want it. If you like the program, if you get something from it, please support the show over at patreon.com slash other PPL pod. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash other PPL pod. You can do, uh, you can show your support for as little as $1 a month. There are different tiers, different levels of support. As you move up the scale, you can get a t-shirt, a tote bag, a coffee mug, a book club, uh, subscription and so on and so forth. Patreon.com slash other PPL pod. If you would like to write to me, if you have thoughts to share, The email address for this program is letters at otherppl.com. The Other People podcast has its own app. The Other People with Brad Listy app. It too is free. Available wherever you get your apps. I should say that the app experienced some glitchiness recently. If this affected your experience of the app, I think we got it all taken care of. All you got to do to fix things is to delete the app off of your phone or whatever device and then go to the app store and just re-upload it and you should get the uh, updated version and everything should be good. All right? Okay. 